It's our declaration this morning of faith to say, God, you are on your throne, that you reign through it all. And so we look to you this morning that wherever we are in our journey, whatever presses against us, whatever fear, uncertainty, source of confusion, wherever we are, Lord, we look to you. Savior of all, one who is Lord of all, who reigns above heaven and earth. And so we say, Lord, have your way with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You're going to have a seat. For some of you I may not have met, my name is Tom Harkis. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad you could join us this morning. Thank you, worship team. I mean, that's a great question. I don't know if I've ever been asked, well, at least not frequently, a question like that. I mean, the most significant truth that's practical in my life over these 58 years, 35 years of vocational ministry, the most significant practical truth that impacts Monday morning at 8 a.m. Wow. Wow. That is a great question. Um, it, well, it just happens that actually we're, we're covering that subject this morning because it has everything to do with what God calls us to, and this is this desperate faith. And when you understand God's heart, that all the other truths are appropriated in this de- desperate faith. All the things that we know about God, or we know about the Christian life, can be distilled down to a practical Monday morning, 8 a.m., desperate faith. And so if you have a Bible, join with me in Mark chapter 9 as we continue through the book of Mark and remembering in the the context that that Jesus is bringing his disciples along in their journey from unbelief to belief, from uncertainty to certainty, from doubt to faith. And there's this journey through miracles and lessons that he's bringing them along through. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at a passage that, as you read through, you might say, well, how does this even fit? But as we step back and we pan the context, you'll see it fits beautifully to see the masterful inspiration of God's word as it ties into a Monday morning application for each of us. Now, as we go through this, I'm going to um, have you at different times break up to someone near you and share your thoughts. and, And if you don't feel uncomfortable with that, just listen. That's fine. You don't have to say anything. But just listen, but I'm going to really ask you to think about what we're talking about, because my goal is that you would really interact with the text, that through inspiration, God's Spirit would, as it's been recorded for us, that would be illumined to say, all right, now I I understand what God is saying. He's touching my heart through that, and there's application for me. You say, well, well, this desperate faith, you know, what's, some of you might be skeptical and say, well, really, is it that significant? Is it that helpful, that fruitful? I mean, really, is is it that beneficial? And my answer is absolutely, because the absence of that leaves you at a very interesting place. The absence of what this text drives us to, this the main idea, that being that genuine faith in the true Jesus, the series that we're in, should continuously lead us, his followers, to a desperation and seen most clearly in a life of prayer. And see, the absence of that leads us to confusion, where if we don't understand what God is doing and bringing us to that place of unleashed usefulness that comes in desperation, then we buy into this misperception of God and the prosperity gospel that's out there in a lot of networks and a lot of churches teach that that God always wants things to be great and wonderful and carefree. And and if you're going through trials, then it's a lack of faith. And and it just misperceives and and does great harm to the scriptures and confuses his followers. It confuses people. Another thing, a failure to understand what God's doing and seeking to bring us to this place of usefulness and this desperation 
is this anxiety because we, we think, well, God, I'm, I'm, I'm really suffering and I feel pressed up against the circumstances and, and Lord, I, I, I'm anxious because you know, you're out of control because it's difficult and because and you promised that life would be easy. It's this misperception and also it, it leads to an unfruitfulness. And maybe if we're really honest with ourselves, for some of us, it might even, and this is even crazy to even bring this up, I almost feel like it's sacrilegious. I'm like, I, just to even to, to possibly even suggest that somehow the Christian life would be boring, boring in any way, shape, or form. And if that's you this morning, then God has some specific words for you in any of the place, whether it's confusion, anxiety, unfruitfulness, or it's just yada, 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 boredom in the Christian life. Because for those of us who know Christ and have walked with God, you can say it's anything but what? Boring. <laughs> Amen out there? Yeah, absolutely. And so in this, again, this main idea is that this genuine faith in the true Jesus, it should continuously lead us to this place of desperation. And how that demonstrates itself is through a life of prayer that, it's, as Calvin said, is that it, it's, it's like breathing for the Christian. It's, we have this prayer jerk reaction in life that, that should quickly go to God, that commune with God. And he brings us to this place of desperation to which we are hooked into this power source where we activate this usefulness in our lives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with, I'm going to read the text. And then I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you, what do you think he's driving home? And I'm going to give you a few moments to think about that. But let's remember the context. Now, the context is that, as I've submitted to you before, is the, the book of Mark kind of builds to Mark chapter 8. You've seen these miracles and these revelations of who he is. And then what he does is we see in Mark chapter 8, Jesus asks the question, is who do people say that I am? This is, again, just by way of introduction. And they respond, and, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, um, but who do you say that I am? He says, you, um, you are the Christ. So in this statement, Jesus, is, he affirms that he is the long-awaited chosen one, the Messiah. Now, one thing I want to do is, as, just as we get into the text, I want to comment just briefly on last Sunday, and I appreciate one of the brothers coming to me and just challenging me to think through the text. Um, I had said, based on my own study, is that I felt like the reference to Elijah was not John the Baptist, but it was an allusion to where it does say spirit and power. But I, as I looked closer at Matthew's a text, which I thought I had read real carefully, it does seem to say it actually was John the Baptist. So for some of you going, I was kind of confused last week, and I understand why. And so um, as we go on is that um, Jesus has, has had reference. If you're here for the first time, just delete what I just said and just, just hang with me here. Um, and so in this is that we see the context is he says that I'm the long-awaited chosen one, this one who would bridge the gap between God and man created by our sin. Over 300 Old Testament prophecies written in some cases thousands of years before Jesus came is all about how he would do that, bring us into a relationship with himself, dealing with our sin that separated us from God. So this long-awaited one who would reign, who would suffer, he would serve, he would be one who would lay his life down, and yet he would give life. There's all these prophecies build up, and Jesus steps forward, and, and he says, I'm it. Now, we've seen this already in the scriptures where he says it's fulfilled in your midst earlier in this ministry. Right now, it's approximately five months before he's going to be crucified. And so what he says is there's some confusion with, with his disciples on this, and, and Peter in particular doesn't really take to this nicely about this whole thought of Jesus being crucified and as the one who would die, as Jesus goes on to talk about how he must suffer and be crucified and rise again, is that Jesus clarifies something, and what he does is he invites everyone who's willing to follow him. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must also be crucified. He says he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And he helps us understand what true saving faith is. That when you come to faith, it's not just that you just checked the box or you prayed some prayer, but it is a lifestyle realtering that comes as I believe in Jesus and his spirit comes inside of me. It transforms me from the inside out. That the old Tom, who used to live for himself primarily, or three people, me, myself, and you know those three, right? Is that used to live, is that now the Bible says repent and believe and in that simple act of faith, which is a gift from God, is his spirit comes inside of me and there is a new kid in town, to borrow from a vernacular, right? Is that there is new and God begins to change me and this life is involved in, 
denying myself daily, as, as the Luke account talks about in Luke chapter 9, and then following him, daily denying myself, taking up my cross, and investing our lives completely in Jesus and the gospel. So whoever says, wishes to gain his life, he says, shall lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel shall gain it. For what did it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? And so this is a call to commitment. And so I really believe the book of Mark kind of pivots right here and then it swings on Mark chapter eight. Having said, okay, I am the Christ and you have to come to me. It's a wholehearted faith that it impacts your whole life. He goes on to help them understand that. He affirms them, as we talked about last week, by revealing his true identity. He gives them a peek into his deity as he unveils himself and allows his true identity to shine out. And what we talked about last week on the Mount of what we call Transfiguration, where his figure was altered and the light beam came forth like the, the brightest sun of the day in his clothing and his, in the, the other accounts that even his face was altered in this brilliance. And then in, right in the heels of that, he comes down from this mountaintop experience with the three disciples, and he comes to our text today. And our text today is we see that he comes in, there's a challenge here that's going on here. There's a great crowd, and there's some arguing going on, and Jesus walks upon it as he sees what's happened, and we see this account starting in chapter 9, verse 14. And when, they came to the, when he came to the disciples, he's come down from the mountain now, they saw a great crowd around them. So he comes to the nine. He's taken the three up to the Mount of Transfiguration where he had allowed his, his true deity to shine forth, unveiled, just to give him a glimpse. He comes down where the other nine were, and they're in the midst of this argument with a great crowd. And these scribes, the religious leaders, are arguing with them. And why they're arguing is because they could not deliver, in Jesus' name, they could not deliver this boy who had been possessed. And so here we see this account that Jesus steps forward and he says this, a great crowd of them and scribes arguing with them and immediately all the crowd when they saw him were greatly amazed and ran to him and greeted him and he asked them, what are you arguing about? Okay, so now the question asked is, why are they greatly amazed? It's an interesting word. Well, I can't help but think that part of it might have been that much like Moses in the Old Testament, when he came down from the mountain having met with God face to face, that his faith face shone like something like it would be like having a a, a really a, a ladies i don't know what's it called when you folate your skin i don't help me out exfoliate is that the term all right exfoliate yeah it's something like that but now multiply it times 100 okay so you get the impression you know it's like this brilliance of his face this kind of afterglow and I can't help but think that some of that is that's what they're amazed by. They could see that Jesus looked different. They're amazed by it. That's the only thing I could, could kind of guess based on the context and what had happened just previously. So they see this and they come to him, they run to him, they greet him. And he asks them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone, here it is, the, the, the father of the possessed boy. And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he, was a, he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit, it's it, in the context that we look at Luke's account in Luke chapter nine, as well as Matthew's account, in chapter 17, is that we see that, that this is an evil spirit, this is a demonic spirit, is that when it sees Jesus, immediately it, the boy convulsed, it throws him to the ground, and he rolls about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, again, we tie into the other references that give us in, in basically three different perspectives of, of the account here is he's actually thrown himself also on his knees before Jesus here. And he's crying out. And again, just think about that. If your child was 
un, uncontrolled on your part, you couldn't protect him periodically, was throwing himself into water as to drown and throwing himself into the fire and was convulsing. And you could just imagine just for a moment just what that would be like as a parent. Just the desperation, and it implies it had been for a while, since childhood. My guess is that that this child was probably early adolescence. And so this has been taking place for years, and you can imagine he's gone to different authorities, and he's, 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 he's tried everything he could, and there's this desperation that comes as he cries out to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, please help me, have compassion. If there's anything you can do, please do it. And Jesus said to him, if you can, All things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd had came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never again enter him. And after crying out and convulsing this child on the ground, he terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, and after three days he will rise but they did not understand, saying they were afraid to ask him. Again, this sounds very similar to chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them, again, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So we see this couched in the sandwich of the gospel proclamation of the the main mission to which Christ came. We see this account. So now it's your turn. Take a moment. Turn to someone here, give your best shot. Why did God inspire this here, this account? Give it your best shot. Go ahead and turn to the person next to you. I'll give you a few moments. All right, let me go ahead and bring it back together. Let me bring it back together. And some of you go, my God, it's kind of early to actually, actually ask me to do some thinking on a Sunday morning. Um, so I, I know I'm taking a risk, but I, I, think, I think you all can do it. Because I think as we avail our hearts to scripture and give it a, just a chance for you to think about it and on your own and more of a self-discovery. I think there's more of a cementing on truth that leads to long-term transformation. So the chances are, is, you, is um, because of the sake of time, I, w- I wish we had the opportunity just to hear what each of you shared and came up with, because I think that would, that would be helpful for all of us as a learning community to understand what God is saying. But let me submit this to you as someone who's had a chance to meditate on it throughout the week, the last week and a half or so, is when we understand that everything is in its place for a reason in Scripture. None of it's it's haphazard. And if you were, as a first century, when you, if you would have gotten the book of Mark, the chances are you would have read Mark 8 and 9 within maybe five or 10 minutes of itself. So you have to understand and interpret it within the context of what's going on. And what we have to understand here to really grab hold of the truth is that Jesus has just revealed who he is in unmistakable ways. I am the Christ. He's tied it in with his main primary chief purpose of coming, to be crucified, to rise again, to deal with our sin issue that separates us from God. He's then called us to the only appropriate response, which is a faith that is all-encompassing where we daily deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. He affirms the, the validity of that and, and affirms because of who he is. And as he reveals and affirms it, and you hear from God the Father, this is my son, obey him. This unbelievable mountaintop experience, and then he comes down the mountain, and here's this account, which is kind of an interesting account. This, the disciples are trying to deliver this child from this possession of this demon. It, they're ineffective in it. They can't do it. It's causing this conflict. And Jesus calls his disciples, and, he, and it's interesting, again, if you tie in the other accounts, is he, he does this parallel. He, in this comparison in the text, you'll see that he says, you know, you had little faith. They said, and you had little faith, and this is in, as we tie in all three accounts. One of the things he says to him is, your faith was little. That's why you didn't see it. And then he says, in contrast, what's needed is what? Is prayer. It's prayer. That this, this is an, this desperation. And so in contrast, you see the, the father who sees God work, 
He sees the hand of God, and what does the father possess? A desperate faith. It's, it's fragile, it's often, and, and, and I would submit to you in some sense incomplete, because even as he goes to Jesus, he says, if you can, how if he, if he really knew who Jesus was, he would take the, the conditional off of it, the if. But even in this is it, we see that, the, that God is bringing forth this, this comparison for us to help us understand for us to be people that understand who Jesus is and we turn from self-rule and believe in him and have this all-encompassing life that is grabbed by the Messiah, he's gonna bring us to this place in our lives to see that actually played out that's gonna involve a desperation in our life day to day that causes us to trust God when it's very difficult at times, when it's hard. It's a picture of this is the faith that we have. How do you see that actualized in your life? How can you really on your own deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow Jesus? How do you genuinely know how to do that? He says, you're gonna be like that father who's like saying, Lord, um, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's gonna be you and your journey. In contrast to the disciples, which I submit to you, having done this before, we see in Mark chapter six, they've delivered people from demons on their own, that probably they because they've done it before, they a little bit had this attitude of, of independence. Hey, I've been here, done that. And so there, there's not the dependence that was, would be accompanied by prayer and desperation. And so I think really the point of what he's driving home is this main idea, is this that, that the true faith in, in the true Jesus leads us to this place of desperation in our lives. That God wants us there because it activates this this usability in our lives that's accompanied by prayer. That we were people that say, God, I need you. God, I am desperate. And he always is pressing us. He always keeps us. Can I, am I the only one that identifies? He always keeps us off balance in life. I mean, isn't, isn't that often the case in the Christian experience as we walk with God is that he brings us ongoing time and time again to that place of saying, Lord, I am desperate for you today. I, don't, I am inadequate, I am woefully inadequate to be the person you've called me to today, to deny myself, to lose my life for your sake and the gospel. So Lord, I'm here. Lord, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief today. Lord, I wanna follow you, I, I wanna know what that means, but Lord, you know how fragile I am and how my tendency and propensity is to wander. And so there's two truths I want to submit to you to grab hold of. And the first truth is, is, is that true faith in the true Jesus is a journey requiring desperate faith. Desperate faith. What does that mean? What does it mean? Like if you look at the text and if you look at the father of, the, of that child who had been possessed, that is the real focal point, is what he does is, as he cries out to Jesus and how Jesus responds to him, is how would you describe that desperate faith in the text? Just think about that for a moment is how would you describe, because in, in understanding this, that's really what we want, right? Because I'm submitting to you, and I'm, I'm proposing this, is that's the very thing that activates usefulness and usability in our lives, to be a part of God's great story, is this desperateness. And, and so what he continually does is keeps bringing us to that place of be, being the desperado, right, in our lives, or desperada, maybe, for you ladies, is that, you know, in our lives, this, this daily clinging to the Savior, God, I need you, God, I... But if I don't understand that, then I'm confused and I'm like, God, where are you? And God, you don't love me. And God, you're not powerful. And like he's, but no, he's actually accomplishing the very thing he promised to do through the circumstances that press against me, that, use, that lead me to fruitfulness. And so <clears throat> true faith in the true Jesus is a journey requiring desperate faith. And what does that tr desperate faith look like? Just think about it for a moment. It's honest. That's one of the things it is. It's honest. It's, God is not surprised by your confusion. <clears throat> you don't have to put your best foot forward to God. He already knows your heart. He already knows you got two left feet. He, you know, there's no need to put your best foot forward. He already knows our frailties. He knows our, our tendency to wander. Just an honesty to say, God, this is where I am today. You know, Lord, and there's this honesty, desperate faith is, is anchored in an honesty before the God, the, an audience of one that we go before God. And, and I believe that's really the heart of this man in the text and why he's highlighted in his interaction with Jesus is there's an honesty. The second thing is there's just a humility. 
There's just a humility. You say, God, I am, I am desperate for you. If you can, oh God, this is where I am. I'm in a dark place. I'm in a difficult place. God, I don't know what to do. I don't have this wired. I am far from being um, a Tony the Tiger. I'm more like Tiny the Tim, right? I'm, I'm just not, I don't have it dialed in. And so he, it's an honest, it's a humble, but also it's a dependent one. It says, Lord, I need you. I can be honest. I can be, in a sense, uh, humble, but it's got to lead to a dependence to say, Lord, I need you to, sh- to strengthen me here. I need you to, to show up in my life because, God, I want to be the one in the midst of your great mission and story that loses my life for your sake in the Gospels. But God, left to myself, I want to hang on to my life. I want to I live a comfortable, secure life that doesn't know risk, that doesn't know heartache, that doesn't know difficulty, doesn't know pain. But Lord, you keep pressing me to those areas. You keep me off balance with those things in life. And so there's, there's this dependence that it should elicit within us. And this dependence that says, God, I trust you, God, I'm, I'm, I'm yielded. Then lastly, a submission. There's a submission. There's a submission. When he says, Lord, I, I, God, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. You, you've got to have a sense of this, is that he looks to Jesus. There's an attitude of submission is part of this desperate declaration. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That, Lord, I'm here. Yes, I, I believe in you. I, I believe in who you are. I believe you can do this. But, Lord, I, I'm not dialed in here. And I'm, 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 I believe, but on the other hand, some, I, I, don't, I don't believe too. And so you see this picture of desperation. Again, as we look at the different accounts in Matthew 16, Luke 9, and also Luke 17, where it, it talks about how God, even if your faith is like a mustard seed, like the smallest little seed, you could say to this mountain, move and it'll move. And the emphasis is not on the quantity of our faith, but really in the quality of the relationship that we have with Jesus. It says, Jesus, I trust you. Lord, I'm, I'm losing my life for your sake in the Gospels. Lord, you are great. You are worthy. You are the Christ. And so I submit. I love you. I yield to you. You have the title deed to my life. I've been bought and paid for at a great price. And so here I am, Lord. I want to follow you. I believe. I trust you. But Lord, I'm, at times I, I don't believe in it. And I have this duality and this par- tension in my heart that's going on. And so, Lord, I look to you. I look to you, Lord. Would you meet me. He contrasts the disciples' little faith with the desperate faith of the Father. And so what does this look like in real life? And for those of you who are in your journey and you haven't bent your knee to Jesus, you haven't been what Scripture talks about being born again, where you've had this life-altering encounter with the risen Jesus, who's, who is alive and reigns. And if you haven't had that encounter yet and you're here, um, the chances are that God has often well, well, the chances are he's gotten your attention. Much like that man who had the son that had been possessed here in the text is that God is working. And so let me encourage you to press on to him that you're not far. Because the fact that you're seeking him is the, real, the realization is that then you, he's seeking you. And so keep going. Keep pressing into him. If you're here and you're going, I haven't quite put this together in my head and, and I'm not sure about this, but I'm desperate in life. You're not far. You're not far at all. Just cry out to him who is able. Just cry out to him and say, Lord, save me a sinner. Just to, to go all the way. I just think how many times I've seen people over the years come to Christ. And often when they come to Christ, as I mentioned before, and previous I've said this with some of you, is that he, to quote from Spurgeon, he often sends the black hounds of heaven out to, to in a sense, to herd through trials and circumstances, the black hounds of heaven, trials and circumstances to bring his people in to himself, the, the good shepherd the one who died for us, right? I, my mind went back to this week of a, a gal who we met in our neighborhood. It, when I, we started Crossway Chapel, uh, the first Mountain View was the first one in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I remember we had shown up and, and we, we met our neighbors because our dog was a male and he wasn't fixed and their dog was a female, hadn't been fixed. And so somehow he had the tag and he figured out where we lived and he shows up at our door and he's kind of this pseudo-intellectual guy, and, and uh, they were both D1 swimmers uh, at the University of Colorado State, and they had, um, they had all sorts of different things going on in their lives, but they returned our dog, and we said, we'll try to keep our dog away from your dog, which is like three blocks, four blocks away. 
and I've developed a little bit of a relationship with them, and they show up at our launch, and we start to get to know them a little bit. And, and one of the things that came out of this that was that she was just terrified of death. She was just gripped by death, and there had been some illness, and, and she, was, she didn't know Christ. And, and she, it was one of the things that God used in her life was, was health issues, and she came to faith. And, and he came to faith. He came to become a lover of Jesus. We baptized both of them. He became one of our pastors of our church plants. As a guy got hold of his life, having, he was an engineer, and God eventually called him into ministry from that place. And, and so in that, as we see often is in my, my experience over the years, is that God gets our attention. And so when, I, when I'm with people and friends and lo- family members that I, I love and care about and are growing to love and care about, is when life is pressing against them, I will try to point them to the good shepherd. I'll point them to the one who is their creator and who died in their place that they might have life. Just to point them, say, you know, this is hard what you're going through. Maybe you've lost a child or maybe you've you've been diagnosed with cancer and this is hard, I know. But let me encourage you that there is a savior and a good shepherd that, that is calling you to come and believe and receive. That you might know the one who created you by himself and what? For himself, right? And so for those of you who don't know Christ, that desperate faith is, is let God call you all the way. For those of us who are believers, then let us be people that understand is that, that God is continually and will continue to bring us in places of life where we are off balance in life that we would what? That we would what? That we would cling to him. That we cling. And somebody say, well, my life's actually going pretty well. Just wait. Just give it, give it some time and, and the, that God ha- will love you enough to get you to a place of usability. That's what he'll bring you. And if it's not through you, it's people around you whom you love who will be going through it. And it's a it's, it's good thing. It's not a bad thing. And so one of the things I've had to understand is it is the most loving thing that God can do is to keep me dependent. Heaven awaits the things we long for of joy and health and peace and all that, it awaits in fullness, right? That longing in our hearts, it awaits. But on this side of eternity, Jesus, eternity, Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, right? But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It's all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. I mean, it's, it goes on that, that anticipate James chapter one, that encounter trials, for the testing of our faith, consider it all joy. It is part and parcel of the journey of the Christian life is this, this desperate dependence that comes as God keeps us off balance in life. And so here's the, the, the application. Embrace it. Embrace it. Just to say, Lord, I embrace where you have me, God. I embrace the heartache. I embrace the difficulty. And Lord will meet you and bring this intimacy that comes from that when we Think about in Hebrews chapter four, a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses and offers grace to help in time of need. Am I the only one? Even last night, I was on the phone with some folks from different parts of the country and just life is messy and sad. It is just downright sad. Often, and, and, and I don't have to convince you of that. If, you, if you're past 10 years old, you probably know some of that already, Right? And how God brings us to that place often where he says, I want to manifest myself in the messiness, in the darkness, in the difficulty. I want you to meet me there. That's my calling card to draw near. I want you to meet me. There's no other way we can deny ourselves and take up our cross apart from this desperate faith that God calls us to. Say, God, I trust you. God, you're working. He says, my grace is perfected in your weakness. And so often when I feel inadequate, which is a lot of times in life, and just when I thought, you know, you you have a certain part of your life dialed in, God says, no, 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 no. This is all me, and you are utterly helpless without me, and I want you to draw near, and I want you to experience intimacy with me, and also a, a faith that's desperate that unleashes usability in your life. Often he'll bring me to that place. Let me submit a second truth besides and that true faith and the true Jesus is a journey of desperation. It's also is that true desperate faith is most clearly demonstrated in the discipline of prayer, in the discipline of prayer. Because notice what he goes on to say. Remember, looking back at the text, 
His disciples asked for clarification. You know, why couldn't we deliver this boy from being possessed? And this goes back as Jesus had, had released him and, and delivered him. And in verse 28, and when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now, some of you can see in the, and I've also added fasting, only because in the King James account, it, or the New King James, it'll also add that in fasting. Um, I think regardless of whether you see that as in the initial text or not, the, the bottom line is that we see is that fasting is a reflection of faith. And it's a good discipline where we withhold something, often it's food for a period of time, so we can focus on prayer and be focused on our dependence on Christ. And so desperate faith is most clearly demonstrated in the discipline of prayer, that we say, Lord, I need you. Again, the text he's saying is that, and I have to believe based on the contrast in Mark chapter six, where they were already been delivering people from possession, is that the disciples kind of got a little bit independent of you know, self, you know, trusting themselves, you know, self-adequate. You know, I, I think I, you know, I've got this. And so there wasn't the same amount of faith and obviously the same amount of prayer because Jesus is saying this has to be delivered, something like this has to be delivered by prayer. This calling out to God. And I think the assumption is, is that, that this is more of a continuous calling out to God, that it's not just a one-time prayer. I, I again, believe in the text. It wasn't like they didn't try to deliver people in Jesus's name, which is a reflection of prayer. My guess is that they tried in Jesus's name to deliver this boy, and, and they probably said in Jesus's name, which is, again, a, a small expression of prayer. But Jesus seems to emphasize their faithlessness in contrast to praying, that I need to be a man of, or woman of prayer, a person, a young person of prayer that says, God, I trust you. I, I want to demonstrate this, this faith, this desperate faith by clearly saying, God, I want to pray. I, I, want to, I want to continually, as 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, to be committed to praying as an ongoing part of my life. To say, God, I need you throughout the day. That we have prayer jerk reactions in life as we encounter things, as we're driving. And, and, and for me, I just try to create space in my head so that some of you know it is um, I, I don't listen. I typically just don't listen to the radio when I'm in the car. Now that's not that's a Tomism. That's not from the Lord for every person here. But it's but I'm simply saying is like even in long trips, I just tend to say, Lord, if, even if it's a 10 hour trip, Lord, I'm just going to pray because I, I, my, my life is so busy with stuff and things. I just need time to be still and hear from God and pray, pray for God to, to show up because I know I can't transform lives. I can't heal people. I can't be the one that opens dead people that are spiritually dead to make them alive. And so just trying to create space in my life and in my head just to be a person of prayer. And I, I know for both Clark and I, just trying to make it a regular discipline each morning or once each week for spending a morning in prayer. And, and we usually skip, incorporate some type of fasting and or you know, three to four hours where we're praying, and we're praying for you, and we're praying for things around you, and, the, and each of your names in the body. We try to make that a discipline. As I've tried to do is just praying for each of you that I know of, and I have to try to keep a running list of, of, of each of you. But just asking the Lord, because you know, the reality is, is, that, is that I'm desperate. I, I have this unique place in, 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 as a pastor in this church that the Lord's gonna hold me accountable to. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says that it talks about a relationship and responsiveness that you as a body should have to us as elders because we watch over your souls and we'll give an account for you. And, and, and as I, I had a conversation with somebody recently, is it, um, and I, I share with them, you know, you know, some people say, well, I really don't want your account, your, your shepherding. And, and what comes to my mind is, what has that got to do with it? I have a responsibility before God that I'm going to be held accountable to. And so it's, I mean, that's kind of a harsh way to say it, right? It sounds kind of ouchy, but that's kind of the, the essence of it is for me is I feel this, this weight. I know as pastors that, Lord, we are desperate. We're, we, we are, we're going to be held accountable for you as a body, of you being on mission for Christ, of you being a, a part of the journey. Have we done all we can to equip you, to warn you, to caution you, that you might walk in freedom in, in part of God's story where you're losing your life for his sake in the gospels. That, that's, that's our job description, right? 
combining with Ephesians 4 to equip the saints for the work of service, right? And so in that is that there's a desperation, and one of the things that should characterize us as leaders more than anything is a life of desperate what? Prayer. Lord, unless you show up, nothing's going to change in these people's lives, and they're headed toward destruction. Or they're going to blow off their foot, and they're going to keep blowing off their foot and shooting themselves in the foot. And Lord, would you intervene in their lives? And we've been at it long enough, but we see the trajectory. We see where this is going. I'm like, Lord, unless you intervene, that's going to be a sad ending. And so, Lord, please, please glorify yourself. Lord, please intervene. Please move in the hearts of these people. Please get them beyond their controlling world and, and liberate them to love you with a desperate faith. And so, Lord, would you give us wisdom what that looks like? And that's going to be accompanied by prayer that, Lord, I, we need you. We need you to work here. So Jesus teaches, how, interesting enough, and we see in Scripture, what does he teach them? He teaches them how to pray. He commands them to pray. And, and, and again, I think this, what this is, this desperate prayer, it's, it's kind of like a, a power tool in a sense, right? Because as, as we're being used by the Lord, um, and each of us are called to be missionaries. If you know Jesus Christ, he's given you the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. All those who he's reconciled, he's given the ministry of reconciliation. But it would be kind of like trying to get some work done for the Lord if you're prayerless without what? Without the power, right? Without plugging in. And I can find myself at times like that, right? I'm trying to do the Lord's work and I'm working hard and I'm like, man, why isn't this working? You know, mm. and, and I'm you know, usually holding the cord of prayerlessness that I've skipped the last couple of weeks, you know, and, and there's nothing's happening, right? And so what does God do is he continually brings things into my life that are humbling, things into my life that bring me back to that place of awareness to say, Lord, um, that apart from you, what, I can do nothing. That God, I want to go back to that desperate prayer of saying, Lord, I, I want to be hooked in, right? I want to be hooked into you. And so, Lord, let, bring me, as you force me to this place, Lord, help me yield to you because it unleashes usefulness in my life. That, that I can see God's hand. And, and so how often in my life he's reminded me that, say, Tom, is that let your life be characterized by a prayerfulness, this prayerful life. Because I don't want you to waste it. I don't want you to waste your life. And so how does this catch you this morning? How does this catch you? And because God's calling us to this place of genuine faith in the true Jesus that should continually lead us to this desperation before God and most clearly seen in our life of prayer. This, this journey of faith, and it's demonstrated by this discipline of prayer. And so what's the action step for you this morning? What, where, where does this catch you? I'm going to ask you to take a few moments, turn to someone near you, maybe if you're with your spouse, if those of you might be married or a partner or people that you want to turn next to them or person you're dating or whatever the case might be, and just turn them, just share what comes to mind or friend or just take a moment and share with them what comes to mind. Of how does this, where's the action step? Where does this intersect your life? where you are this morning. Well, take a few minutes. Genuine faith in the true Jesus should continually or continuously lead us to desperation that's reflected or demonstrated in prayer. I believe that's really what he's calling us to. It's that's what it's going to take for us to live out Mark chapter 8, where he says to lose our lives for his sake and the gospels. That Jesus would say, we would know the reality of, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. This call to dependence. And a failure to understand this is going to leave you confused. It's going to leave you anxious. And you're going to find yourself in the control mode of trying to control your circumstances instead of submitting to the God who's in control, it's going to also lead to unfruitfulness. You won't be hooked up to the power source. So the very place he wants to bring you in desperation, this desperate faith that leads to usefulness, you won't get there. So you'll find yourself not seeing God use you in your ministry, in your life, as a missionary in your world. 
And then, I mean, again, I hate to even say this, even a place because it lacks reality is that there's this boredom that will set in. This complacency, like yada, 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 the Christian life, I get it. There's just lack of reality because you're not in this place of desperate faith and seeing God show up in your life because you've insulated yourself in this risk-free zone. And so God is, is gonna be one that continues to work and depress that in your life. And so, I mean, in... 58 years of life, if there's the one truth I think that brings together all of the truths that I understand what God says about himself in scripture is this desperate faith. This desperate faith that says, God, I need you. God, every day I'm desperate for you. And so I look to you and it has this sense of honesty and humility and transparency and submission to say, God, I I need you. I'm so desperate for you today as I'm part of losing my life in this, this day for your sake and the gospel's. And so I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm, I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to, to close your eyes for a moment. I'm, going to, I'm just going to read some quotes from, you, from believers and, and saints, some saints that have gone before us. Before I'm going to... I'm going to invite the worship team up as well. But let me, let me ask you to just keep your eyes closed for a moment. And, and just to think about some of the application, the truths that are related to this. Number one is that anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strengths. Charles Spurgeon. Gary Thomas, God must do a work in us before he can do a work through us. A.W. Tozier, there is more healing joy in five minutes of worship than there is in five nights of revelry or partying. C.S. Lewis writes in The Four Loves, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven you can be safe from all the dangers and perpetrations of love is hell. Samuel Rutherford wrote that they lose nothing who gain Christ. Spurgeon again wrote, God grades on the cross, not the curve. John Owen I believe that if there is one thing which pierces the master's heart with unalterable grief, it is not the world's iniquity, but the church's indifference. And then Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, seek for happiness and you'll never find it. Seek righteousness and you will discover you are happy. It will be there without your knowing it, without your seeking it. In response, I would ask that as we're going to sing in a moment, but I'm going to ask that if, if your heart this morning you're saying, you know, I, I want, I want really a heart that, that takes that step of de- desperation, of humbling myself, of yieldedness, of submission, of honesty before God, that he might use me and that I might lose my life for his sake in the gospels. I'm gonna read a prayer. It's an old prayer that had been written by a believer many years ago on our needfulness, our neediness. And if that's your heart, then during this time as I read this prayer, it takes about a minute, I'm gonna just ask you to stand in declaration of dependence and your need for the Savior. This is thou eternal source author of all created being and happiness. I adore thee for making man capable of religion. 
that he may be taught to say, where is God my maker who giveth songs in the night? But degeneracy has spread over all our human race, turning glory into shame, rendering us forgetful of thee, we know it is thy power alone that can recall wandering children, can impress on them a sense of divine things, and can render that sense lasting and effectual. From thee proceed all good purposes and desires in the diffusing of piety or holiness and happiness. Thou hast a knowledge of my soul's secret principles and art aware of my desire to spread the gospel. Make me an almoner to give thy bounties to the indigent, comfort to the mentally ill, restoration to the sin diseased, hope to the despairing, joy to the sorrowing, love to the prodigals. Blow away the ashes of unbelief by thy spirit's breath and give me light, fire, warmth of love. I need spiritual comforts that are gentle, peaceful, mild, refreshing, that will melt me into conscious lowliness before thee, that will make me feel and rest in thee as my all. Fill the garden of my soul with the wind of love, that sense of the Christian life may be wafted to others, then come and gather fruits to thy glory. And then lastly, so shall I fulfill the great end of my being, to glorify thee and be a blessing to men. Yeah. And so, Father, that's, I pray, would be our declaration, Lord. Our declaration. If that's your heart, too, I just would ask you to just stand with me, too, is that's your heart, to say, God, I, that's my heart, to live before you. And so, Father, we, we say, Lord, we are needy. We are desperately needy before you. And we desire to respond in this desperate faith that says, Lord, you're it. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief as the man cried out to you. That that would activate in us a usefulness in our lives, that as missionaries in our world, that we would see people come to know and love you, that would transform their lives forever. And in response, we say, Lord, have your way with us, God. Would you use this Holy Spirit, fill us.